Hi everyone, and we're back with Wish. Um, the last time that we met, Charlie, um, we met a little girl named Charlie Reese, and she was had to go and live with her aunt and uncle because her mom um, was depressed and couldn't get out of bed and couldn't take care of her, and her dad was in jail. And she only had her sister, who was not old enough to take care of her. So Charlie has gone to live with her aunt and uncle, and she it's up in the Blue Ridge Mountains, and it's re really rural, meaning it's out there. There isn't a lot around, and it's in on a mountain. And she goes to a school, and she refers to the kids as hillbillies, and her friends say that they probably all ate squirrel sandwiches, which they don't. Um, but her aunt and uncle are giving her the space that she needs and she meets, um, a friend and while well, he's not really a friend as of yet. And, um, let's see. And his name, man, I can't even remember what his name is. She calls him the up down boy because of the way he, because of the way he walks and Anyway, we'll come across it when we get to it. So I'm going to start with chapter six. A few days later, Mrs. Willoughby called Bertha about my bad attitude. That day in school, she had asked me if I had two-thirds of a piece of pie and I wanted to give half to, be, to my sister. Then how much of the whole pie would that be? I told her I wouldn't give my sister any of my pie. Everybody had laughed except Mrs. Willoughby. She had turned red and pressed her lips together and made her eyes into little slits when she looked at me. When she called Bertha that afternoon, I was stretched out in Gus's easy chair watching TV. The fat orange cat named Flora was curled up in my lap. I heard Bertha say, she did, and oh dear. Then she lowered her voice and I could only make out bits and pieces drifting through the kitchen door. A rough time, missing her family been hard on her. Then she hung up and I kept my eyes on the TV when she came in and sat on the couch. That was Mrs. Willoughby, she said. A fast guy talking on TV was pouring chocolate syrup on the floor and mopping it up with, the, with a miracle mop. She told me that you've been a little rude in school, Bertha said. Now the man on TV was showing the set of knives that came free with the miracle mop. Then Bertha started going on about how she knows how upset I must be about my family being all broken like broken like it is. Well, she didn't use the word broken, but she might as well have. She said she knew how it must be scary to see Mama like she was, how I must be worried sick about Scrappy, how I must miss Jackie so much. I kept my eyes on the mopping man, and in my head I said, Pineapple, pineapple, pineapple. But Howard's stupid idea didn't work because the next thing I knew, I was hollering at Bertha. Mean words about minding her own business and who cared about my broken up sorry excuse for a family. Not me, that was for sure. The words kept spewing and got louder and faster. How I hated Colby and all those hillbilly kids in this nasty old house hanging off the side of the mountain and those canning jars in my room and especially those Cinderella pillowcases. Then I stalked outside, letting the screen door slam behind me and trying not to think about Bertha sitting there on the couch looking like she'd been stabbed in the heart. A couple of cats leaped out of my way as I stormed across the yard and up the driveway toward the road. I kicked at dirt and yanked on leaves and hurled gravel into the woods. When I got to the road, I didn't even care that the asphalt was burning hot under my bare feet. The mad was swirling inside of me, making my ears ring and my stomach churn. But then, the next thing I know, I was sitting in the dirt on the side of the road, crying so hard I couldn't hardly breathe. What was wrong with me? Why had I said those mean things to Bertha? Why was I acting so hateful at school? And then, while I was sitting there wallowing in my pity, somebody said, What's the matter, Charlie? I looked up to see Howard standing by his bicycle in front of me. I put up, put my knee on. I put my head on my knees and mumbled, "Nothing. Must be something." He said, "Go away." Nah. He laid his bicycle in the weeds by the road and sat next to me. You have to tell me what's the matter. This boy beat all. He sure had a lot of gumption for a little old red-headed up-down boy. I don't have to tell you anything. I said. 
Then you have to tell somebody. He pushed at his glasses. Why? My mama says you should never keep your troubles to yourself. She says if you share them with somebody, they get smaller. Go away, I said. Did you kick somebody again? I shook my head. Poke him with a pencil? No, I hollered. Mama made this needlepoint sign that says, if all our troubles were hung on a line, you choose yours and I'd choose mine. I lifted my head and stared up at him. What's that supposed to mean, I asked. It means everybody's got troubles, and some of them are worse than yours. He yanked at a blade of grass and tossed it into the road, or something like that, he added. Ha, that was a good one. I couldn't think of anybody with worse troubles than me. Then I looked at Howard with his eyebrows knitted together and a look of pure worry on his face, and before I knew it, I was spilling those troubles out to him. I told him how I wish Scrappy wasn't in jail, how he and I used to play poker and watch Wheel of Fortune and eat macaroni and cheese for breakfast. I told him how scared I was when I saw my mama crying into her pillow and in the, in the dark bedroom, not even caring one little bit whether I had clean clothes or even went to school. I told him how mama and Scrappy would holler at each other would holler at each other the live long day while me and Jackie sat on her bed with the radio turned up loud so we didn't have to hear them. I told him about all those times I watched from the bedroom window when Scrappy drove off with his tires screeching and gravel flying while Mama yelled, Good riddance to bad rubbish from the front porch. I told him how much I miss Jackie, who knew all the words to, to nearly every song on the radio and would French braid my hair and share her nail polish with me. And then I told him those mean things I said to Bertha. When I was done, the silence settled over us, still and soft like a veil. The sun had gotten lower in the sky, sitting on top of the mountains in the distance, and the air had grown cooler. For a minute, I thought maybe Howard was embarrassed by all that stuff I'd told him and didn't know what to say. I was starting to wish I'd never shared my troubles with him like that. But then he looked right at me and said, want my advice? Um, sure, I guess, I said. You can't do nothing about Scrappy. And then back in Raleigh, he said, the only thing you can fix is what you done to Bertha. I guess he was right. I couldn't fix my mess of a family, but I could try to make things right with Bertha. I stood up and brushed the dirt off the back of my shorts. And then I could hardly believe my eyes right there. The edge of the woods was that brown and black floppy-eared dog. I put my finger to my lips and went, shh. The dog was watching me with his head cocked to the side. Don't move, I whispered to Howard. I took one slow step toward the dog, and guess what? He wagged his tail. Two tiny little wags. That dog liked me. Hey, fella, I said taking another step. Then, wouldn't you know it, a car came roaring up the road and whizzed past us, and that dog darted off into the woods. I stamped my foot. Dang it! I'd almost forgotten Howard was there when he said, I've seen that dog before. He's mine, I said. Really? Well, he's gonna be. I bet he's full of tricks, he said, and he might have the mange. Stray dogs have the mange. So what, I said. His name is Wishbone. The minute I said that, it felt right. Wishbone. That was the perfect name for my dog. I'm going to catch him, I said. Then I'll bathe him and get the ticks off him and teach him tricks and let him sleep in the bed with me. I'll help you catch him, Howard said, picking his bike up out of the weeds. You will? Sure. Suddenly, Howard seemed different. He didn't seem so much like a nosy, up-down boy nagging me half to death about being my backpack buddy. He seemed more like somebody being nice to me, somebody I had shared my troubles with. I watched him get on his bike and pedal off toward his house. Then I called, bye wishbone, into the woods before I hurried up the road to make things right with Bertha. Chapter 7. By the time I got home, it was getting dark. Gus's old rattle trap of a car was in the driveway and the smell of spaghetti sauce drifted through the screen door. My feet felt like cinder blocks as I made my way across the yard toward the house. More than anything, I wanted to just go on back to my room and pretend like this day had never happened, but it didn't. 
because apologizing to somebody when you do something wrong is, it's very hard. I put one cinder block foot in front of the other until I was on the back porch where Gus and Bertha sat gazing out at the mountain view. Hey, I said, and my voice sounded like a sniveling baby. I kept my eyes on the leaf-covered floorboards of the porch. Hey there, Gus said. I couldn't look at Bertha, but her silence smacked me hard. I sat down and studied the fading hearts and stars I'd drawn on my arm. From somewhere way down in the woods, a bullfrog croaked, sending his deep-throated call echoing out into the cool evening air. I counted to three in my head, and then I said it. I'm sorry, Bertha. Then I did what I'd told myself I most definitely would, would not do. I cried, and I swear I could not stop no matter how much I wanted to. The worst part was that I couldn't get myself to tell Bertha those things I'd practiced in my head, like how I didn't mean to holler at her, how I don't hate this house perched on the mountainside with Pegasus up there shining out over the porch, how those canning jars don't bother me one little bit, and most of all, how I love this Cinderella, because who doesn't? But all I did was cry. And then Bertha was kneeling in front of me with her warm hand on my ink-stained arm. You are a blessing in this house, Charlie, she said. A blessing? She should have called me mean and hateful and dumb and sorry. But she called me a blessing. Then Gus stood up and said the perfect Gus thing. Let's have some of that blueberry, blackberry cobbler before supper. So that's what we did. The three of us sat on the porch as the stars were beginning to twinkle up in the Carolina sky and ate blackberry cobbler before supper. And while Bertha told us about her friend Racine back, how her friend Racine backed her car into the flagpole at the post office that afternoon and then just drove, drove on off like nothing had ever happened, an acorn dropped from the branches of the oak tree hanging over the porch and fell right at my feet. I nearly spilled my cobbler when I jumped up and grabbed it. I had almost let that day slip by without making my wish. And now here came an acorn like it was dropped right down from heaven. I hesitated, but then I went on and did what I had to do. I turned in a circle three times, clutching that acorn tight and making my wish. Then I went back to my room and sat the acorn on the windowsill. I would leave it there for three days to make sure my wish would be even stronger. That's what my Girl Scout leader in Raleigh told me about acorn wishes. And that could not be a lie because Girl Scout leaders do not lie. After supper, we had more blackberry cobbler. Gus went out to the garden to make sure the sprinkler was turned off. And Bertha said, stay right here, Charlie. I wanted to show, I want to show you something. She went to her room and came back with a tattered shoe box. She took the lid off and said, look, I peered inside, photographs. Bertha rummaged through them and took one out. She smiled at me and handed it to me. Your mama and me, she said, pointing to the handwriting on the back, Bertha and Carla in big printed letters. I took the faded photograph from her. Two young girls sat on the hood of a car with their arms around each other. Which one's mama, I asked. Bertha pointed to the smaller girl. I squinted down at her. She was missing her two front teeth and had a band-aid on her elbow. I could not take my eyes off of that girl. I imagined her getting down from that car and skipping in circles. I imagined her singing with her big sister, Bertha, in the back seat of her da their daddy's car. I imagined her telling knock-knock jokes and roller skating and eating ice cream on her porch at night. And when, when had this gap-toothed little girl turned into that sad woman in, the dark, in her dark bedroom in Raleigh? Did y'all love each other, I asked Bertha. We sure did. Then she showed me some more photographs. Mama's, Mama opening a present beside a Christmas tree. The two of them playing with a puppy in the snow. Bertha pulling Mama in a wagon on a dirt road. Why don't y'all see each other anymore, I said. Bertha let out a big sigh and shook her head. We grew up, she said. When you grow up, sometimes life gets complicated. That wasn't a very good answer, but I could tell it was the only one I was going to get. So I just said, oh. 
When Gus came back in from the garden, we went out on the porch. They held hands while Bertha told us about some old man selling moldy strawberries from the back of a truck on, route, on Highway 41. Then she said, you can call Jackie tomorrow if you want to, Charlie. No, thanks, I said. It was so quiet I could hear Bertha breathing. I could feel her looking at me, but I stared out at the treetops. Charlie, she said, don't be mad at Jackie. I'm not mad at Jackie, I said, but that lie was like a cl dark cloud settling over us. I was mad at Jackie. She acted like she didn't have one single trouble hanging on her line, and she didn't care one bit about me. Then we sat there in silence, breathing in the cool night air and listening to the crickets under the porch. That night when I went to bed, I laid there in the dark and pictured a clothesline full of somebody else's troubles. I knew for sure there were a lot of them I'd rather pluck off of that line than mine. I imagined what the other troubles might be. There would probably be toothaches and failed math tests, lost cats and ugly hair, cheating boyfriends and broken down cars, but none of those could hold a candle to my troubles, weighing down that clothesline like a sack full of bricks. I tiptoed to the window and stared out into the night, thinking maybe... I'd see a falling star to wish on. The moon was bright over the mountains and sent a shimmering glow across the yard, making shadows that snaked around the dogwood tree and crept along the garden fence. I knew Wishbone was out there somewhere all by himself. I wondered what he was doing. Eating stale bread out of someone's garbage? Trotting along the highway in the moonlight? Sleeping under somebody's porch? I hope Gus wasn't right about Wishbone wanting to be a stray, but then I remembered how he had wagged his tail at me that day. He liked me. I was sure of it. And he was if he was mine and didn't have to be a stray anymore, I bet he would love me more. I clasped my hands together like I was praying and whispered into the darkness, Please come back, Wishbone. Chapter 8 on Saturday, Howard was going to help me look for Wishbone, but I, but first I had to go shopping with Bertha. I haven't been I haven't been to Asheville in ages, she said, getting behind the wheel of Gus's old car. It started with a rumble, sending puffs of black smoke drifting out of the tailpipe and floating over the yard. As we wound our way down the mountain and onto the highway, Bertha chattered nonstop. She told me about the time she and Gus went camping and a baby bear got into their cooler and stole their hot dogs. Can you believe that, she said, a bear eating hot dogs. She talked about how much she hated snakes and how when a tiny brown gardener snake got into the house, got into the house once, she stayed with her friend Janelle for nearly a week until Gus swore on the Bible that it was gone and she could hardly stop laughing long enough to tell me about the time some guy named Arthur Kruger got drunk and lost his false teeth at the church picnic. I didn't even want to think about where those teeth would turn up, she said, wiping her eyes. I didn't even eat any more potato salad after that, that's for sure. Finally, I figured I'd have to interrupt her, so I did. But what about you and Mama, I asked. What do you mean? Tell me something about y'all. Uh, well, um, let's see now. I waited, watching her face, seeing her searching for just the right thing to tell me. When I was about ten, she said, so let's see, Carla would have been about seven. We spent the whole summer making yarn bracelets to sell so we could buy fish for an aquarium our uncle left, gave us. Yarn bracelets? I wondered how many, how come Mama never showed me how to make yarn bracelets. Then, Bertha went on, this mean boy who lived across the street from us threw every one of those bracelets up into the hickory tree, nut tree in our front yard, way up in the branches so we couldn't get them down. She shook her head. Isn't that so mean? Why did y'all, what did y'all do? Well, that's why I'm telling this story, because it's just so like Carla. She said she stomped over to that boy and bit him on the hand so hard he hollered like she cut off it, cut his hand off with a butcher knife. Then he ran home crying while she hollered cuss words at him. Bertha chuckled. That girl had some kind of temper, she said. A temper? Maybe I didn't get my temper from Scrappy after all. Maybe I got my temper from Mama. 
I hesitated, but then I decided to just go for it. How come y'all stop seeing each other? I asked, hoping maybe this time she'd give me a better answer than she had before. Bertha stared out at the road ahead. Well, you know, when we got to be teenagers, we were so busy with this and that and the other thing. And then she dropped out of high school, and the next thing I knew, she was hightailing it to rally. But how come y'all never see each other now? Bertha pressed her lips together and shot me a look out of the corner of her eye. It's kind of complicated, Charlie, she said. There it was again. Another not very good answer. So we drove on in silence until we got to Asheville. At the mall, I couldn't help but think about Jackie. She and I used to spend all day at the mall, wandering from store to store, trying on crop tops and miniskirts that were never allowed to have. Picking out earrings we would buy if our ears were pierced. Excuse me. Spritzing fancy perfume on each other from the samples at the cosmetics counter. Let's go to Sears and look for Sunday school dresses, Bertha said. So we shopped all morning, and by the time we headed back to Colby, I had two new dresses and a lavender cardigan sweater. Bertha thought one of the dresses might be too short for church, but she bought it anyway. When we got home, Howard was sitting in a lawn chair by the garden watching Gus doing some repairs to the fence. Hey there, Bertha called. Howard walked his up-down walk over to the car as I was getting my shopping bags out of the back seat. Hey, he said to Bertha. Then he turned to me and said, I drew a map. What for? To help us look for wishbone. He took a piece of folded notebook paper out of his pocket to show me. I figured we could mark the places we look, and it will help us keep track. I shrugged. Okay. Bertha reached for the shopping bags. I'll take those inside, she said. Then me and Howard headed off toward the road, peering into tangled shrubs and squinting into the dark woods along the way. Howard thought we would check the path where we had seen him yesterday. I bet he hangs out here a lot, he says. Maybe. I pushed some tall weeds aside and jumped over the shallow ditch that ran along the edge of the road. But Gus said he's liable to be anywhere, I added. We looked and looked, climbed over fallen trees and pushing through prickly vines. But after a while, we were hot and tired and hadn't seen a single sign of wishbone. So Howard whipped out his map and a stubby pencil and marked the places we had looked, and we decided to call it a day. The next day, I marched into Sunday school in my new dress and plopped right down next to Audrey. I said, hey, and she acted like I was invisible. I guess she forgot I was part of her church family. First, we had to play the, that Bible detective game again, and Howard added to his collection of Bible bucks. I couldn't get over all the stuff he knew about the Bible. What was Moses' brother's name? How many times a day did ravens bring food to Elijah? Audrey waved her hand almost as much as Howard did, jangling her bracelets and going, I know, I know. After that, Mrs. Mackey told us we were going to decorate the bulletin board in the fellowship hall and would call and would be called our garden of blessings. We'll be making a garden of flowers to show our many blessings, she said. Then she explained that we would make construction paper flowers and write one of our many blessings on each one. I confess I wasn't too clear exactly what that meant, but I followed everybody else and got colored paper and glue and scissors. I worked real slow, hoping I could see what everybody else was doing. Sure enough, Audrey finished hers first, a big yellow daisy. Then she used a blue crayon to write on one of the petals, my family. My stomach squeezed up and my face felt hot. I put my hands in my lap so nobody could see me shaking. That yellow daisy lay there on the table in front of me, reminding me that I did not belong here, letting me know that even though I was here in church in my new dress, I did not have a blessing. May I be excused? I said to Mrs. Mackey, but I didn't even wait for her to answer. I hurried out of that room and went outside to the parking lot. But before I had time to start feeling sorry for myself, something good happened. I saw a red bird, a big, bright cardinal on the telephone line across the street. I closed my eyes, spit three times, and made my wish. Chapter 9
Come to my house after school tomorrow, Howard said on the bus the next morning. I have a plan. What kind of plan, I asked. A plan for catching that dog. Wishbone, I said. His name is Wishbone. Howard took a bite, out, bite of the toast he had brought on the bus with him. Whatever, he said, we still need a better plan than a map. I don't see why we can't. I sat up and grabbed Howard's knees. Don't move, I said. His eyes got wide. What's wrong? Take off your glasses, I said, real slow. Why? Just do it, I snapped, a little louder than I'd meant to. He took off his glasses and then squinted over at me. There's an eyelash right there, I said, pointing to one of the thickest, one of the thick lenses. I need it. Why? To make a wish. A wish? If you blow on an eyelash, you get to make a wish. I took the glasses from him and pressed my finger on the lens. Then I held it up so Howard could see the tiny red, reddish eyelash. See, I said. Then I closed my eyes, made my wish, and blew, sending that eyelash out into the air where it disappeared, probably settling on the floor with clumps of dirt and chewed gum and trampled spelling tests. What did you wish for, Howard said. I can't tell you, I said. Why not? I flopped back against the seat and rolled my eyes. Jeez, Howard, I said. What? I explained to him that if you tell your wish, then it won't come true. Everybody knows that, I added. Howard wiped his glasses with the end of his shirt and put them back on. I've made a wish every single day since fourth grade, I said. Howard bugged his eyes at me. You must want a lot of stuff, I I shook my head. No, just one thing, I said. I always wish for the same thing every single time. The minute I said that, I regretted it. I knew what he was going to say next, and sure enough, he did. Well, if you're making the same wish every time, it must not be coming true, he said. So what's the point? Seems dumb, kind of dumb to me. I felt my face turning red and that familiar feeling of anger starting to churn in my stomach because... Someday it will come true, I hollered, making a bunch of kids turn in their seats and stare at me. <clears throat> Howard looked at me over the top of his glasses and said, Pineapple. I kicked his, back, his backpack hard, sending it sliding out into the aisle of the bus. I confessed to feeling a flicker of regret when some kids laughed at that, but Howard, he just picked it up, brushed the dirt off of it, and said, Pineapple, Charlie, remember. I held on to my mad feelings all morning, taking every opportunity I could to shoot razor-sharp glares at Howard or to bump into him real hard over by the pencil sharpener. I never should have told him about my wishing. I never told anybody, and now that I had, it did sound dumb. Why would anybody make the same wish every day if it never came true? Maybe I should give up. But then, guess what happened? I looked at the clock and it was 11.11. Closed my eyes and made my wish. By the time I got home from school, my mad feelings about Howard were gone and I was glad he had a plan to catch Wishbone. When I told Bertha I was going to his house the next day, she was tickled pink. She kept telling me how good I was to be friends with Howard because other kids were so mean to him. Even in church, she said, can you believe that? I didn't tell her I sure could believe that with the likes of Audrey Mitchell in that so-called church family. That afternoon, Howard dropped into the seat next to me and said, You can borrow my brother Lenny's bike. For what? So you can get home. Better than walking. He took a smashed bag of potato chips out of his backpack and emptied the crumbs into his mouth. I got a real good plan, he said, you know, for catching wishbone. And wasn't that just like Howard to go right on wanting to help me after I'd picked his back, kicked his backpack and did me, and been mean to him like I had yesterday? So when the bus stopped at his house, I followed him and Dwight across the weed-filled yard, up the rickety steps, past the ratty couch, and into the, that sad-looking house. When I stepped inside, I didn't know where to look first. A hamster cage on the coffee table, a drum set in the corner, stacks of books and magazines lining the walls, some kind of tree planted in a rusty bucket by the window. 
The floor was littered with blankets and pillows and shoes and board games and plastic bowls with popcorn kernels and pretzel crumbs in the bottom. The walls were covered with crayon artwork on construction paper and school papers with gold star stickers and nice job written at the top. I could see that Mrs. Odom's rutabaga trick with Howard's brother Cotton wasn't going working too good because there were lots of drawings with colored markers along the bottom of the walls. Howard stepped over the pillows and stuff and motioned for me to follow him into the kitchen. Mama, he said, Charlie's here. Mrs. Odom turned from the sink and smiled the nicest smile. Well, hey, she, she wiped her hands on her apron and put her arm around my shoulder and gave me a little squeeze. Howard told me you're his backpack buddy at school, she said, and about that wishbone dog. Then she started going on about how Gus and Bertha were so happy to have me here in Colby with them and weren't the Blue Ridge Mountains heaven on earth. After that, she put a cake with pink and purple flowers in a cardboard box from the grocery store on the kitchen table and told us to, to have some. The next thing I knew, that little kitchen was filled with boys pushing and poking and grabbing at that cake. They didn't even use plates or forks or anything. Just cut a slice and ate it right there, dropping crumbs on the floor, and Mrs. Odom didn't seem to mind one bit. The oldest boy was Burl the only dark-haired one, loud talking and a friendly face with a shadow of a mustache over his lip. Next was Lenny, Lenny in a grease-stained t-shirt. His freckled arms were long and skinny and he kept punching Dwight and elbowing Burl. Next came Howard and Dwight, who were only a year or two apart and could have passed for twins, except Howard wore glasses and had that up-down walk. And the youngest was Cotton, dirty-faced and sticky-fingered legs all covered in scrapes and bruises and band-aids. Mrs. Odom gave us water and paper cups and made the rounds kissing and hugging each of those boys. It didn't take a genius to know that Bertha had been right about the Odoms and their good hearts. I don't know why, but I felt shy and out of place in there with the noise and energy bouncing around and sheer goodness clinging to the walls of that house. Howard and I sat on the couch on the porch and he told me about his plan to catch Wishbone. He had it all written down in a notebook and even had pictures drawn, drawn with colored pencils. You think it'll work? I asked. Sure. Howard closed his notebook and hugged it to his chest. Then we sat in silence watching Lenny and Cotton filling a plastic bucket with rocks and dragging it to the side of the yard where they were building some kind of wall. Dwight rode his bike round and round the yard, stirring up clouds of red dust while Burl hollered at him to stop stop, because he was trying to change the oil in his truck. Then me and Howard decided to look for Wishbone some more. So we went past, spent the rest of the afternoon tromping through the woods and wandering up and down the side of the road, but finally gave up. By the time we got back to the Howard's house, to Howard's house, Mrs. Odom was telling everybody to wash up for supper. Stay and have supper with us, Charlie, she said. Before I could say anything, Mrs. Odom added, I'll call Bertha and see if it's okay with her. Mr. Odom's driving a load of lumber over to Charlotte, so you can sit right there in this in his chair. So we sat at the table, and before I knew what was happening, Howard grabbed my right hand and Dwight grabbed my left, and they all bowed their heads while Burl said the blessing. He thanked the Lord for nearly everything under the sun, including the deviled eggs on the plate in front of him. Then everybody said amen and drove out, it dove into the, that food like they hadn't eaten in a week. Mrs. Odom kept jumping up to get more pork chops and pour more milk, and it seemed like she couldn't walk by one of those boys without patting their shoulders or kissing the tops of their heads. I tried to imagine taking Howard to my house back in Raleigh, so quiet and dark. My school papers would not be taped on the wall, and Mama would not kiss me on the top of my head. There wouldn't be any cake with pink and purple flowers. If Howard stayed for supper, he and I would eat pork and beans or potato chips or bologna sandwich in front of the TV, and nobody say, would say a blessing. When it was time for me to leave, I thanked Mrs. Odom, climbed on Lenny's bike, and set off for home. As I pedaled up the road, I turned and glanced back at the Odom's house. I remembered that first day on the school bus when I had seen it and thought it was so sad looking. 
Then I pictured all those boys in that little kitchen getting loved on by their mama, and that house didn't look one bit sad anymore. Chapter 10. When I got home, I told Gus and Bertha about Howard's plan to catch Wishbone. We're going we're gonna to build a great big trap, I said, stretching my arms out to show how big, with chicken wire from his daddy's shop. Gus's eyebrows shot up. A trap, huh? I nodded. Well, kind of. More like one of those big dog crates. We're going to put it out on the edge of the woods besides the garden shed, and then we're going to stick branches and leaves and stuff in the chicken wire so it blends in. I went on to explain how we're, we were going to put something good to eat inside the crate. When Wishbone, whoops, and when Wishbone went to, in to eat it, we closed the door. He likes my meatloaf, Bertha said, and hot dogs and bologna. She tossed a couple of pieces of fresh a fish stick left over from supper on the floor for two of the cats. Now, I don't want to rain on your parade, Charlie, but what if that dog isn't friendly to people? What if he bites? What if he has some kind of dog disease? He won't bite. He likes me, I said, ignoring the question about the dog disease. Gus, Bertha said, tell Charlie about that dog you had when you were a kid. And then she went and told me about Gus's dog named Skeeter, who used to catch rabbits and bring them home for Gus and his sisters to play with. And one time he climbed in the back of a produce truck and ended up all the way down in Hendersonville and showed up on the front porch the next day full of porcupine quills. Right, Gus? Gus nodded. Right. And then one time he dug a, up a hornet's nest, Bertha said. That dog must have had nine lives like a cat. Must have, Gus said. Tell her about how he waited for you outside school every day. Bertha scooped one of those cats in, onto her lap. Oh, and tell her about how he used to steal chicken livers right out of the frying pan. We're going to bore this kid, this child to death, Bertie, he said, winking at me. Right, Butterbean? Gus had started calling me Butterbean sometimes. That made me feel like a baby, but I didn't say anything. Then told Bertha, and then Bertha told us about some woman in the grocery store who fainted in the cereal aisle, but I wasn't really listening because I was thinking about Wishbone. I pictured him waiting at school for me every day. Then he'd run along the side of the bus like he'd done that day. I saw him fighting. Maybe the bus driver would let him on the bus because he was so smart and would do tricks for all the kids. He'd sleep in my bed every night, and I'd sing good old Noah to him. He'd let me pick, put Jackie's Raleigh High t-shirt on him and maybe even paint his toenails red. I'd teach him to go up to the end of the driveway on Sunday mornings and get the newspaper before church. He'd chase rabbits out of the garden and sit out on the porch with us every night. I still had a little niggle about Mama having a hissy fit when I brought him back to Raleigh with me, but I pushed that aside. By the time Bertha went inside to get a box of graham crackers for us, I was so in love with Wishbone, I couldn't hardly stand it. I sure hoped Howard's plan worked. Let's go. Let's go set up the sprinklers in the garden, Gus said to me, tugging on his dirty baseball cap. I followed him outside with three cats sauntering along behind us. I helped him untangle the hose and drag it out to the garden. While he attached the sprinkler to it, I walked up and down the tidy rows of pole beans and squash and tomato plants growing bigger every day. The soft dirt was warm under my feet. Suddenly, a ladybug landed on my arm. I put my finger next to it and let it climb on. Then I held, up my, held my finger up and whispered, Ladybug, ladybug, fly away home. As I watched that ladybug fly off into the sky, I made my wish. Jackie called again that night. She told me she had put those blue streaks in her hair, and now everybody at school was copying her. I swear, Charlie, she said, everybody in Raleigh's got blue streaks in their hair. Then she told me she met some boy who played guitar in a band and had his nose pierced. His name was Cockroach, and her sort of kind of boyfriend, Arlo, didn't like him. Cockroach, I said, because, of, because what else can you say to that? But she kept on talking. She couldn't wait to graduate and kiss that school goodbye. She and some girl 
named Shayla might move to Fort Lauderdale if Shayla's uncle had could get them jobs in his Mexican restu restaurant. But if that didn't happen, she might go to school to be a dental assistant. She sure had a lot of plans, but it seemed like none of them included me. Are you going to come visit me sometime? I asked in a tiny voice that sounded like a baby. Of course I am, Charlie, she said, as soon as I get time. I guess she had lots of time for co cockroach, but not much time for me. Out on the porch that night, Bertha told Gus about her day while I sent my thoughts zipping through the trees to wherever Wishbone was. I wanted him to know he didn't have to be a stray like me. I wanted him to be mine. Then my mind wandered to the Odoms. I wondered what they were doing right at that very minute. I bet they were all piled on pillows on the floor eating popcorn and playing crazy apes. I bet Mrs. Odom was taping their school papers up on the wall and telling them how proud she was of them. Then she'd have to say, rutabaga, so Cotton would stop drawing on the wall with markers. Gus interrupted my thoughts when he stood up and scratched and said, time to turn in. I hated the thought of another day at school, that awful bus with gum on the seats and kids snickering when I walked by. Mrs. Willoughby frowning at me and tossing my marked up papers onto my desk with a sigh. The cafeteria with kids flinging peas at each other and, and ignoring me. There were only a few more weeks of school left, but it felt like a hundred years to me. There was no doubt about it. I needed wishbone more than ever. And we're going to stop right there. So until we meet again, have a great day.